What inspired you to write Survivors Children's Lives After the Holocaust? Thanks so much, Paul. And uh, thanks to everybody. It's a real pleasure to be with you virtually. Um, I'm actually sitting in my office in Durham in the northeast of the United Kingdom. This question about what inspired me to, to write this book. There's two parts to the answer. So the book, um, Survivors, Children's Lives After the Holocaust. I know you've been talking for the last uh, three days about hidden children. Uh, the book is a little, has a bit of a broader catchment, I suppose. There's, there are lots of hidden children in the book, um, but there are also some children who survived uh, in concentration camps and um, some of them in uh, fleeing to the Soviet Union. But in all the children in the book, and I look at a hundred different children in the book or people who were children during the war, they all were in some capacity in continental Europe and directly experienced persecution during the war. So to explain why I wanted to write this book is a little bit, um, takes a little bit of a complicated sort of trajectory through my own career because I am a Holocaust historian. This is my third book, um, but that isn't quite why or what motivated me to write the book. So I'm also an oral historian, which means that I do a lot of my research through interviewing people or using interviews um, that people have previously recorded. And that's really what I love about my work. I, I love the oral history aspect. And when I was a postdoctoral student, I was employed on a big project that actually had nothing to do with the Holocaust. It was about activism in the 1960s. And we did a lot of interviews for that project. And I was the actually the project Italianist. And I don't even really work on Italian history anymore, but I did then. So we all trooped off and there were 14 historians on this project and we trooped off to do these interviews. And each of us did between 50 and 100 interviews. So it was a lot. And they were wonderful interviews. They Actually, in the end, the Holocaust did come into them a bit, but you know, for the most part, they had nothing to do with that. They were about student activism and different types of activism in the late 60s. And what I really started to notice, because I was doing so many interviews for that project, was the, the shape of the narrative when we tell the story of our lives. And I think this is true, you know, if Paul, I, I was interviewing you right now about your life, you'd probably start your story in the place that everybody else starts their story, which is your parents and the town you were born in and, you know, like the, the origin of, of where you come from. It's really very fundamental, I think, to our identity to be able to explain, I'm from this family, I'm from this community. And I started to think, huh, if this is such a really important part of the shape of a story, a life story, what happens if you don't know the answer? What happens if you can't explain where you come from because you never don't know who your parents were or you've never been to the community where you're from, right? You know, that part of your life is entirely cut off. How do you tell the story of who you are? So that's actually the, the intellectual reason why I, why I worked on the book. And in a minute, I'll read you a little excerpt from the book that has to do with that. But there's a personal reason as well. I'm a very honest about it. My mother is a child survivor. Uh, she's not a, a hidden child. She was with her mother, my grandmother, through the entire period of the Holocaust, but uh, she is an infant survivor. She was born in 1944, and the stories in the book have a lot of parallels with her story. She's not in the book, and it's not about her, but in another way, I suppose it is, and certainly I've learned a lot about my own family working on this, and uh, I'm very grateful for that. So, but just to explain, going back to the kind of more intellectual reason, I what I'm going to do in the talk today is, is Paul's going to ask me some questions, and I've got some a couple of not a couple, I've got four different short readings prepared, and so I would like to read you just a very short excerpt from the introduction to the book that I think explains what motivated me to write it. So. Young children's experiences in the Holocaust shed light on a question with profound repercussions. How can we make sense of our lives when we do not know where we come from? Because their pre-war memories were indistinct or even non-existent, and because there was often no living adult able or willing to fill in the key details of their earliest days and years, these child survivors of the Holocaust often faced a decades-long struggle to assemble the tale of their origins. A simple but essential act of autobiography, fundamental to identity, 
If you cannot recount the story of your own family, your hometown, or your formative experiences, how do you make sense of your childhood and its impacts? What work do you have to do to explain who you are? Most of us take for granted that we can make at least some sense of our childhood memories. We do not often stop to think of this as a privilege. At its core, this book explores what it means to grow up and to grow older when you do not have that advantage and are forced by your circumstances to weave the story from your, of your past from scraps. It is a book about the Holocaust, but more fundamentally, it's a book about the history of living after and living with a childhood marked by chaos. So I hope that, uh, I think that probably sums up that question that drove me a little bit in, in writing the book. Um, and, uh, and that's probably a, a good place to, to stop my answer to the first question. Okay, thank you so much. That was actually a fascinating, fascinating answer. Um, here's another question. What particularly interested you in post-war lives of child survivors of the Holocaust? So I, I suppose I've partially answered okay, that in this kind of draw, but I've got more. I've got more I can say about that. Definitely. I'm, I'm going to repeat the question for the group. Yeah, go ahead. So what particularly interested you in the post-war lives of child survivors of the Holocaust? Thank you. So obviously beyond my desire to kind of get into, dig into this question of, you know, how do you tell your story when you don't know your origins? I think as you've probably, you've heard some from some really remarkable historians and academics over the past three days, um, uh, all of whom their work has had a huge influence on me. And um, so you'll know that child survivors quite broadly, not just hidden children, have been largely, largely ignored by historians, not the historians who you actually have, were lucky to, to, to have a, a talk with over the past few days, but broadly historians have not done a, a remarkable amount of work on child survivors of the Holocaust. Um, psychologists have done far, far more. And so it was really, I really wish that I could have been in the session with Robert Krell, whose work has also had a, a huge influence on me and obviously really, really leading thinker in this field. But I have a particular interest in the post-war lives of child survivors and actually the post-war lives of, of survivors. And that post-war aspect of kind of this long-term repercussions of the Holocaust in the lives of individuals and families, that's also been broadly ignored by historians. And there's so much work uh, still to do there. And I think it's really a problem that historians have not dug into this question of, you know, how do we go forwards from the point of, of genocide? Because if we want to understand how genocide affects human lives, we need to look at how genocidal events insert themselves into life trajectories. To put it a different way, we need to look at short and long-term impacts and how events like the Holocaust are woven into uh, the life stories of survivors. But I also think one of the things I really learned working on this project um, is how important it is not to mythologize or pathologize both of them, these impacts. So as I think I mentioned before, there's a hundred uh, children, obviously now in their, in their 80s mostly, whose stories are in the book. And absolutely all 100 of them, their lives were affected by what they lived through in the Holocaust, what their families went through. Um, that's indisputable. But it was only one part of their very rich lives. And I think this is worth really driving home. When I went to interview, uh, I interviewed some of them in person and others I used existing interviews. And, and the interviews I did in person often started uh, on the same kind of note, I suppose. So I'd go in and I'd explain, okay, so my project is about your post-war life and the post-war life of child survivors. So I, you know, obviously I want to hear about what happened to you during the war, but it's really your life in the seven decades since that I want to learn about. And they would so often say things like, Oh, well, I've had a really very ordinary life. I don't know, it's not very interesting. You probably don't want to talk to me or I don't know why you want to hear about that. And I always said, if you have gone from that point where you had such an extreme experience as a child and you've gone on to have an ordinary life, that's amazing. I want to hear about that. Let's talk about that. And I think what really came out in the interviews is just how far these 
child survivors Holocaust experience is simply just one facet of their varied lives. So when we look at post-war lives, we acknowledge the fact that a, a survivor is much, much more than just a survivor. A life has a lot of facets and we can take that Holocaust experience and insert it into something far more complex. Um, so I think that's really a task that lies before us as, as historians. As I said, psychologists have done far more work in this, in this area. The difference, of course, um, uh, when you're looking at the work of historians is that we're not thinking particularly about the psyche and the, the, the psychic experience of processing uh, traumatic childhood events, but rather the historical rootedness of them. So what this means as this person moves through different historical contexts, how the events going on around them shape their own relationship to their past. I think broadly I've come out of this um, with a really strong interest in children and children's history, but also memory and the nature of memory and the question of how we remember our childhoods and make sense of our childhoods. Um, and uh, so those are some of the things that particularly drew me to this. Thank you. Thank you. That was, and there's also some of the things that you said also tied into a number of the things that we've already heard. So, okay. So next question is, uh, who is a child survivor? Why did some children not see themselves as survivors? Was this, was this a particularly challenging issue for hidden children? Okay. So this question has many facets. There is, we might even see this as being two questions. Who is a survivor and who is a child? So with regards to who is a survivor, I'm gonna read you an excerpt about this particular issue. I take a pretty broad definition in the book, but all the children in the book were in some way, as I think I've already said, some way they were in continental Europe. They went through the direct and lived experience of, of persecution, whether they were hidden, whether they were in concentration camps, whether they had a kind of flight to a, a third sort of third party, it's not the right word, a different country where they effectively were, were safe. They spent part of their childhoods in that experience of, of persecution. And so as far as I'm concerned, they are survivors. But that, that very term, as I'm sure you've probably heard a bit about over the past few days, the very complex and fraught term that has changed its meaning a lot over time. I'll come back to that in a second. There's also this question of who is a child? And I want to address that, not because it actually is an issue that relates directly to this book, but I think it's a, a question that we need to think about in, you know, when we're thinking about children who survived the Holocaust and maybe comparing them to, um, you know, children fleeing persecution in the present. Because as was the case in 1945, you know, the majority of children who survived the Holocaust and, and, and made it to 1945 were teenagers. Just as the majority of children fleeing persecution in the world today are also teenagers. I say that just to emphasize that it is important to recall that the, the line of where childhood ends is kind of arbitrary. And even in 1945, there was a lot of discussion about who counted as a child. And it mattered because there were special programs run for child survivors, for example, uh, special you know, funds designated for child survivors. So there was a big debate. Where do we draw the line? Is a child uh, anyone up to the age of 16 or is a child anyone up to the age of 18? Does it include 18? You know, it is a culturally specific and slightly arbitrary distinction. It's not actually an issue. Uh, that comes up in survivors because I had to make a choice about who to include in the book. And I made a very deliberate choice to draw the line between, well, basically all the children in the book were 10 years old or younger in 1945. And the reason I did that is because I really wanted to dig into what happens when you have lived through the Holocaust, you've been there, you were there in your body, right, in your person. But because you were so young, you don't remember it at all. You don't remember it in its entirely entirety. You can't remember it in a logical way. You know, children's memories are different from adult memories. So I wanted to see what would happen when we looked at a group who really was struggling to remember. So, so all the children in the book were quite small children. 
And this does relate to that, we can come back to that idea of that term survivor. So as you probably know, as you probably heard about, I imagine over the last few days, that term survivor really in kind of earlier post-war decades had a very, you know, there was no term Holocaust survivor. There wasn't even a term Holocaust till the 1970s that was used in a widespread sort of way. You would sometimes in the 50s and 60s come across terms like concentration camp survivor. And that's really telling because it was one thing to call yourself a survivor if you'd been through a concentration camp, but you can see right away for children who survived the Holocaust, relatively few of them survived concentration camps, far, far more survived in hiding. So then to be able to feel you could call yourself a survivor for a child was really a pretty fraught process. And it's actually one of the things I talk a lot about in the book, and there's a whole chapter on kind of trying to be able to claim that term. One of the things that child survivors encountered was this rhetoric around luck which I don't know if maybe Robert Carl talked about it, but it came up with a, in a lot of the interviews I did that children would be told quite early on, you know, in the 40s, late 40s and 50s, oh, well, you were just one of the lucky ones because you survived and most children didn't. And this sort of idea of the, being a, one of the lucky ones, really a very difficult thing to break out of because it comes from an sort of adult assumption that being rescued meant that you hadn't really survived. You couldn't call yourself a survivor. You were rescued. You were lucky. A very, very difficult rhetoric to get out of. So what I want to do is read you a short excerpt about one um, wonderful survivor who's in my book who ran up against exactly this in the early 1980s. This assumption that children could and would forget the past and focus on the future, that they were lucky and that this luck would be enough to silence their memories. It took a long time to fade. It was child survivors themselves who eventually challenged it, but it was a challenge that took decades to mature. We see this in the story of Felice Zed. In 1983, Felice was only beginning to learn who she was. The year before, at the age of 42, she had finally received confirmation that her parents had been killed in Auschwitz. The family, Felice's parents, David and Lydia, her older sister, Beata, then age three, and Felice, then one-year-old, had been deported from the little town of Waldern in the Baden area of Germany to the internment camp of Gurs in the south of France. The two small girls had been rescued from the camp by the Red Cross and hidden with French Catholic families until the liberation, so quite classic story of hidden children. Felice's parents were deported and murdered. Felice had been trying since her early 20s to trace the details of her own early years and of her parents' lives and deaths, but there were still holes in her understanding. She struck up the courage to attend the first American gathering of Jewish Holocaust survivors, the largest meeting of Holocaust survivors ever held, which is true to this day which took place in April 1983 in Washington, D.C. Hoping to meet others with similar stories, but uncertain where her own story fitted in to the broader context of Holocaust, being a Holocaust survivor, Felice braved the criticism of older survivors who told her, you were a child, so what do you know? You don't remember. Speaking with a volunteer who recorded a short interview with her at the gathering, Felice's frustration exploded. So I'm going to read now from this little excerpt from her interview. And I think what happened is actually at this event, which was an enormous event in, in DC, they hired some kind of roving people to go around the corridors and spontaneously interview people who had attended. Because you can hear in the interview, she's sort of like, oh, why, why are you asking me? Oh, well, okay then. So it's very, very spontaneous, very unpracticed. And so this is what she said. People don't understand. And it's really hard for me to talk about it. I don't belong. I didn't go to a camp. I didn't suffer in that way. There's nothing to show for it. I felt I'm not a survivor. But then I thought, well, I am a survivor in my own way. My parents died. My whole family died. And besides my sister and myself, everyone else is gone. And actually she goes on then in the interview to say repeatedly that one of the problems for her is the fact she doesn't have a tattoo on her arm because she's got literally nothing to show for 
for her experience. Um, and I think this is a really a very a common experience, certainly, to the child survivors in my book. They run up against this kind of exclusionary politics of memory, and it was very, very slow to overcome. Indeed, the first sort of support groups for child survivors, and as that term, a child survivor, dates from the 1980s. So he's a relatively recent sort of switch, I suppose. Thank, thank you very much for, for that, the, the insight um, about this development of the idea of a child survivor and increasing awareness of that. Um, the next question is, the survivors in your book face constantly shifting identities. They live with wartime host families, move to different countries, and have to repeatedly adopt, uh, adapt to different cultures, customs, and languages. How did they respond to this? And we've been, by the way, seeing this over the last three mm -hmm. days, so very interesting. Yeah. Your, your answer. I figured you'd probably encountered this particular issue a lot over the last three days because this is a certainly for hidden children such a powerful part of their narrative that they are that they have to switch identities so many times in such really you know formative years of their childhood. Sometimes, you know, also at the same time, switching nations, switching languages, switching uh, religions. Um, there's so many identity shifts that it becomes dizzying, certainly for a child. I think that is probably true for all the children in the book. Um, and I guess what I wanted to speak to there was how far I tried in my research for the book to see children always as historical actors in their own right and with agency so that, okay, yes, they go through these situations where they're forced constantly to kind of rethink their, their identity, but they're not passive about that. Adults certainly try to impose identities on child survivors or coax them maybe towards certain identities. But what really jumped out at me, both in the interviews, but also in the archival research that I did, was just how good children were at resisting some of those uh, impositions or subverting them um, and basically navigating identity shifts on their own terms. And I think that's really important to remember that children, of course, they are victims in this and they are buffeted around by these forces, but they respond in ways that are sometimes very subversive. And to illustrate how far that could go, I want to read you another excerpt um, and this one is about, uh, it's one of the very few in the book where I could not track down the survivor involved, so I've given her a pseudonym because I haven't been able to directly ask her permission. So I'm working entirely off of her historic case file, which opens in um, 1947, I think, and closes in the 1950s. So this is all from historical documents. So this is uh, the story of a survivor named, uh, it's a pseudonym, uh, Dorota J. I've given her a pseudonym, it looks a little bit like her original name. Um, she was born in 1938 in Poland. She survived the war because her parents placed her in hiding, so she's a hidden child, uh, with Gentile friends. But these friends didn't actually hold on to her and she ends up kind of moving through several different families until her aunt finds her in 1948. Eight. I don't want to get the date wrong. It's be 1947. So she has this long time of being sort of shunted around. And then her aunt finds her, but her aunt is also really almost a child. She's a very, very young woman. And she's also had her childhood destroyed by, by what she lives through in the Holocaust. Her aunts come up with a plan to kind of move them forwards in their lives. So there is um, a scheme run by, it, it's run by the Canadian Jewish Congress, but basically a couple of schemes for immigration to Canada. There's a special scheme for tailors and her aunt has trained as a seamstress, so she qualifies. And there's also a scheme for orphaned children who survive the Holocaust. So they come up with this plan that the aunt, this young woman, the aunt, will uh, immigrate on the tailor scheme and Dorota will come to Canada on the orphan scheme. So sure enough, she comes, she arrives in Montreal, 1948, and she's placed with a foster family. Now, the foster family fall in love with her right from the outset, and they very quickly express their intention to keep her. And it seems to be a mutual. They, they, Dorota loves them, too. 
So that's the background you need to know. And now I will read the excerpt. Oops. Both Dorota and her aunt knew something that the agency and the foster family did not. Dorota's father was still alive and was living in Israel, impoverished and without employment. It's not clear from the notes in her case file just how this secret slipped out in June 1949, but there were swift and angry reactions from the foster family, from the agency. The agency was the Canadian Jewish Congress in this case and from Dorota herself. By this point, the foster family hoped very much to adopt her, but Quebec law stipulated that no formal adoption could take place in such circumstances with the father still alive. Dorota's social worker observed that the agency might try to secure a document from the father consenting to allow Dorota to stay indefinitely with the family, but this would be worthless from a legal point of view. This development seemed to be too much both for the foster family and for Dorota herself. Her foster father wrote to the aunt, and the aunt is just a very young woman who actually has at that point moved on from Quebec and is living in British Columbia. So he wrote a letter to the aunt in a rage, and I quote here from the letter. We are sick of being regarded as criminals. It seems you withheld the truth somewhere. You knew our intentions from the beginning. We have no proof that the father exists. Let him furnish legal documents as to existence and to his right to her. This must be done at once before we make any decision or we will start legal proceedings of our own shortly. We will not permit further mental torture of the child. Contemporary readers may well wince at the thought of a wealthy and secure foster family demanding that a Holocaust survivor utterly without means furnish legal documents to prove both his own existence and his right to his own daughter. Dorota, however, was very much on the side of her foster family and was willing to take action to ensure she was not returned to a parent who she hadn't seen in six years. Dorota began to write what the agency called, quote, the most undiplomatic letters to her original family in the hopes of driving off their claim on her. The Canadian Jewish Congress, for its part, supported Dorota in her fight to stay with her foster family. In the end, she does not appear to ever have returned to live with her family of origin. Uh, although, as I say, I tried very, very hard to track her down and I couldn't, so I don't know the, uh, the end point of that story. It's an upsetting story, but I wanted to read that one because I think it really shows how far children could get involved in those struggles, of, you know, over identity and how far this particular child just put her foot down. It's like, I've had enough of this. I've moved around so many times. I'm happy where I am. Leave me alone to get on with my life. And actually took a kind of, you know, active role in fighting her original family off. And she certainly isn't the only one in, in the book who who really got involved in very complex ways in determining some portion of where her identity would lie. Um, so I think the answer is, of course, as I know you've all already heard, it was a very complex process to navigate all these identity shifts. But children did have some modicum of power in it they did assert themselves where they could. Um, and it did, not in some cases, make quite a dramatic difference in their lives. Thank, thank you very much for that answer and for that really fascinating story about the Dorota and, uh, and how she navigated that, that situation. If you do find out what happened to her, let us know. Well, I will. <laughs> okay, next question is, um, Survivors is all about piecing together a lost past and making sense of early childhood experiences. How far do the survivors in the book manage to do this over the course of their lives? I, before I answer that question, I'm just looking at the clock and I'm thinking, I will, we, I get, we'll answer this question and then we might wanna, I don't know how far there will be questions from you, so, audience, but I wanna make sure we have time for them, that's all. Okay. Uh, cause, sure. cause your questions are, you know, they're, they're more interesting than hearing my own voice, I suppose. But um, so to, to get to this question of that journey of piecing together your life, I have to say that one of the things I always hoped about survivors is actually that anybody could pick it up 
and see some of their own efforts to make sense of their past in a new light. So it's, it is a book about child survivors. It is definitely a book about the Holocaust, but actually it's not kind of how I conceptualized it. I always thought of it as a book about how we make sense of our childhoods and the limitations of that effort. There have been seven decades since the end of the war and many survivors in the book still don't know essential facts about their own early years. And even if they do, they sometimes struggle to put it all together into a coherent life narrative. So these are stories that have a lot of gaps in them. They've got absences and silences. And I actually think in, in some way that is probably true for most of us. Child survivors are an extreme slice of a far more common experience. Many, many people struggle to make sense of their childhoods. If you come from, uh, you know, if you were adopted, if you were fostered, if you had breakups in your early family history, I don't want to compare the experiences, but I know, I hope, that if you picked up survivors and read it, you would see something of your own kind of journey to make sense of your past reflected in the experiences of these um, child survivors. So on that note, I want to read you the last excerpt, uh, really, really one of my favorites, um, about a survivor who actually ends up appearing a lot in the book because because uh, his story is so amazing and I'm very fond of him and I've remained very close to him and he's actually going to be in my next book as well. So Jackie Y. Jackie Y was born in Vienna in December 1941, but he didn't know this. He had tried at certain points in his childhood to ask his parents where he had been born, but they always answered vaguely that he'd been born somewhere in Hertfordshire, which I think is very arbitrary. Uh, Hertfordshire is sort of in the middle of England. And they quickly changed the topic. He had memories which he couldn't make sense of. He remembered, for example, a day when, about the age of five, he had been playing with a group of other children. Someone had taken him away from the group and ushered him towards a young couple. They wanted to take him for a drive in the country. He was then informed that he was to go alone and stay with them for a few days. He ended up living with them and calling them mum and dad, but never quite had sufficient information to begin to unpick what that strange memory meant. He also had a series of recurring dreams that both troubled and intrigued him. One involved a big house with sprawling grounds filled with tall trees that swept down to a horse racing track. Another frightening one involved towering waves coming towards him and water everywhere. His mother told him that everyone had dreams like that. So just to, I didn't want to read the whole thing because it's quite long, but to, just to fill you in, basically, Jackie goes forwards in his life. And little bits of information keep sort of coming to him as he grows older. He learns inadvertently at school that he's adopted and he has a lot of trouble accepting that, but fun that he kind of works through it. And then in his mid teens, his grandmother confesses that he wasn't just adopted, he's actually also not British. And that one's really quite a bit more shocking, but he's just thought of himself as a sort of, you know, East London Jewish boy. And, and suddenly he's like, oh, I'm not. So, but he, he, he comes to terms with it in his own way but he wants to know more and he's pressing his parents and his parents are kind of getting more and more like closing the you know door on this and finally his mother starts to say stop asking because every time you ask you hurt your father and he loves his parents so he backs off as he struggled to learn about his past so Jackie struggled to determine his future he left school at the age of 15 and tried a variety of occupations, hairdressing, working in an electrical shop and a menswear shop, bookmaking, but he settled on none. In his late teens, he met a young woman at a dance and soon fell in love. He asked her to marry him. She said yes, and they found themselves attending the offices of the Jewish Board of Deputies to receive permission to be married in the synagogue. This is in London. They're still married, by the way. With them were Jackie's adoptive mother and his fiance's mother. In the Jewish religion, as I'm sure I don't need to tell you, but it's written in the book, it is necessary to demonstrate that you are Jewish before you can be married in a religious ceremony. And the simplest way to demonstrate this is to prove that your mother is also Jewish. <laughs> this, however, was not a straightforward matter in Jackie's case. The secretary asked to see proof that Jackie's birth mother had in fact been Jewish. 
And this is the point at which I will read you an excerpt from Jackie's, uh, actually this is from his memoir, although I interviewed him as well. My adopted mother assured him that she was and that the document was in the safe deposit box and couldn't he just take her word for it? Certainly not, he said, you will have to go and get it. We went to the safe deposit and I just could not wait to get my hands on those papers. I wanted to see what my mother was trying to hide. I begged her to let me look at them, but crying and shouting, she held on to them. On returning to the office, I snatched the papers away as the secretary handed them back to my mother. To my utter astonishment, I saw that I had been in a concentration camp. My real name was Jona Jakob Spiegel. We stood there dumbfounded. I was hysterical. I had heard about these terrible places and I couldn't accept that I was involved. My mother kept repeating that it was a very long time ago and that I was only a baby. I shouted at her, why couldn't you tell me before? I always find out from other people. That evening, shocked and angry, Jackie asked his father where he had been adopted from. His father reluctantly admitted that Jackie had come from a care home from, for orphans located in the village of Lingfield in Surrey, Surrey's in the south of England. On a sunny afternoon soon after, Jackie and his fiancée drove down to Lingfield. After making inquiries at the local police station, they found themselves standing at the gates of a big house with sprawling grounds filled with tall trees that swept down to a horse racing track, the former Weir Courtney care home for child survivors of the Holocaust. Jackie had walked straight into his own childhood dream. And I wanted to end on that note with that reading because actually the story, um, Jackie's story, but really the story of this one orphanage, the only orphanage in Britain for very young child survivors of the Holocaust, this one in Lingfield in Surrey. Such a fascinating story that I'm now writing a separate book on that particular orphanage. So I'm very kind of deeply once again in, in Jackie's story and the story of the other orphans um, who lived in that particular place. Um, so uh, that one will be coming soon. But I, I think maybe Paul, it's, it, it leaves us um, just a little bit of time for questions. So shall we go over to questions at this point? I, I think that's a good idea. And I, I would like to open the floor to questions if anybody has any questions. By the way, thank you so much for a, what a fascinating. You're very welcome. Okay. I think I think they're all uh, dumbfounded. Thank you. Yeah. Questions? Okay, Ms. Lick, why don't you come and stand um, up? Hi, thank you very much. Fascinating. Um, it's a, something, it's not a question, but like a observation. Even the survivors who are older and did have memories of their former lives, when they survived after the war, those lives didn't exist. Yeah. So their identities changed too. Yeah. Pre-war, you, your father could have been the famous rabbi in the town. Mm. Everybody knew him. Everybody knew who you were. You were the daughter of the rabbi. Yeah. You come to America, they don't even can't even pronounce the name <laughs> of the town, let them know who was the rabbi. So you're you don't have that status anymore as the daughter of the rabbi. Yeah. And you might end up having to work, let's say, in some store or factory, yeah. and all of a sudden, you know, that's must have been extremely painful, even though, you know, they survived and all of that. So they had to deal with that too. Yeah. You know, that, that um, I was once the daughter of, or I was once, my father had the yeah. big factory in town or whatever. And now all of a sudden you're just, you know, and nobody knows that. Yeah. Nobody's interested in knowing it. Yes. Who cares about this little town where your father was the rabbi, you know? So yeah. that um, I'm sure that was a horror very difficult for a lot of survivors. That is such an interesting point. And actually, in the interest of kind of simplifying the story, when I was telling you about Dorota J, the one who I'm using a pseudonym for, I left out some of the more interesting details of that story because I just wanted to tell you the quick version, I suppose. But I can go back and tell you a little bit about that case because it really brings out the point you've just made. So. Dorota's family of origins were wealthy 
And this was known to the agency in Canada. And actually for that reason, it records in her case notes, they placed her with a wealthy family in Montreal. This just seems to have been a standard practice. They kind of tried to discern, okay, what is the family, what was the family of origin for this child survivor? Like, okay, we'll place them with a sort of parallel family. So her father had been an engineer before the war, but he ends up as I said, completely impoverished and without any sort of employment, living in Israel, basically a broken person after the war with all that wealth and, and the status having drained away. And it's because of that, that he can't kind of fight his way back to his claim on his daughter. It comes up a lot in the case notes that they are, the agency wants to support the child to stay because they don't want her to go back to poverty. And I think actually in some ways as historians, we're guilty of not talking enough about social class when we talk about the Holocaust and just how, what it meant to have this kind of precipitous fall in social class. And it's, it's you know, it's both about identity and it is about class status as well. Um, and here's a dramatic example of a family who literally could not be rebuilt because they couldn't sort of reassume that social position. And certainly uh, this came up a lot in the case files that I looked at from the 1940s. This uh, came up often on the part of children themselves who didn't want to go back to impoverished families. Also came up a lot on the part of parents who survived. Um, it's really quite shocking in the case, if you look at the case of France, um, children, a lot of hidden children, um, ended up being cared for by an organization called the OSE after the war. And what's devastating is when you look at the OSE's uh, organizational literature, a huge number of children in their care had surviving parents, usually surviving mother. But because that mother was so impoverished and so in such precarious financial circumstances, the parents preferred for the children to stay in the orphanage rather than go back to the original family. And sometimes those children never went back. You can look at the OSE reports from like 1952 and the children are still living in an orphanage and they're not going back at that point, they're teenagers. So this change and deep change in class status and identity, it affected children, it affected parents and it kept families from being reunited. So I think that's an excellent point. Thank you very much. Um, I just had a couple of questions from the chat and then um, let me read this because they were, they were already submitted. So um, one of the questions is, has Ancestry.com or Jewish Gen or other similar organizations been helpful in any of this kind of work? That is a great question. And the short answer is a funny one, actually, because up until last week, I had never used them. Uh, I've got so many archival resources that I that are brilliant that I've actually never felt the, the need to use them. Um, but I for this new book that I'm writing, I do need to try to trace what the mostly the death dates of some of the people involved. So I have been using um, genie.com and ancestry.com. But I think the more important thing is not whether I use them. It's whether the child survivors themselves use them. And that is so interesting. You could almost write a whole new book about it because I am very close to some of the child survivors in the book and we are in touch frequently. They're, they're getting quite old now. And one of the things that they did during the pandemic lockdown is start to build family trees on, on Jewish Gen and on, on Jeannie and on the other ones. Um, some of them did the DNA testing as well. And they have managed in some cases to piece together extended family trees that they never knew about before. So I know that I said to you before that some of them still don't know very basic details about their families of origin. In a way, the lockdown has been a kind of gift of a moment in time when they were stuck in their houses that they were able to do this and kind of reached out to people across the world. And of all funny things, my mother also did this. Um, and I mentioned before that my mother is a child survivor as well. She has found second and third cousins in countries across the globe that we didn't know existed. And she's reached out to them and she's become sort of Zoom friends with some of them. And I think if that's the kind of end point of the story, what an amazing <coughs> note, note to end on, I suppose, because to discover that you've got family when you thought you had really none and to reach out to them and find they want you and you want them 
is quite a remarkably powerful thing. And I think in some way the pandemic made that possible in a new way. So kind of like an interesting final chapter. So thank you for that question. And thank you. Thank you. And a great answer and a great and great insight. Okay, I think we have a, a, a Miriam. So do you want to come up and, and present your question? Yeah. My question is, you talk about, and here, generally, I'm uh, standing in front right here so she can uh, here. Uh, speaking about children from concentration camps and different places, what about children who survived who were in ghettos and then in the partisan and in the woods? Is anything recorded about it, anything that people did some research? Mm. Because in my family's case, my parents yeah. were teenagers and yeah. the war ended in 45, my mom was 17. Yeah. So what about that? Well, I don't look at anybody for whom that's true simply because all the children in the book are genuinely really very young children. So none of them end up with the partisans, none of them end up living in the woods. I know, of course, that happens as quite a common experience for older children, teenagers, to have gone that route, especially if they found themselves in areas like um, you know, that edge of Poland that borders with the Soviet Union or in the Ukraine, et cetera, or in the Soviet Union. This, this happened quite widely. What I'd love to be able to tell you is a great book written by a historian that touches on that topic, but I'm afraid I don't actually know of one. It sounds like a book that needs to be written. There's certainly lots of memoirs that look at that experience, but in terms of a scholarly study that looks specifically at young people who end up in the partisan brigades, I'm not aware of one, um, and I think it would be a wonderful topic for a book and probably really needs to be written. No, thank you. Um, I have a couple more questions here. Um, uh, one, okay, one of them, uh, thanks for your comments that they are true and relevant um, from uh, a woman who is a, a teacher who is the wife of a child survivor. Um, a question that we had also was, how did Jackie get out of the concentration camp? Mm. that's kind of a, a yes. big stretch so that is actually the topic of my next book so I want to say watch this space but I can tell you in in summary um Jackie was one of uh, a group of well I guess there's two different ways to look at the group Jackie was one of a group of 300 survivors of Teresian stat um who were brought to Britain in the summer of 1945 now, the majority of those were teenage boys, and um, the story of those teenage boys has been told in, in different places, and I don't write about them too much, although I, I certainly know their story. There was actually just, um, I mean, I know you're an American audience and you will probably won't be aware of this, but there's a fabulous docudrama on the BBC last year, I think, early 2021, specifically about the older teenagers who came in this group. I look at the younger children who came in the group, so there were six toddlers, Jackie was one of them. So six children under three years old and a little handful of children between the ages of four and 10. And they all end up in living in this orphanage that I'm writing about. But maybe the question is actually about how did Jackie survive on his own as an infant in Theresienstadt and make it to Britain? And the short answer to that is nobody knows. If you know about Theresienstadt, though, you might know that it was set up in a way to protect children as well as the Jewish council could possibly make it. So there were children's homes, a kinderheim in Theresienstadt, and there was a home for infants. And it was, uh, you know, inmates who were, um, who were adults cared for the children in that context. And the children were given like kind of food rations were directed towards the children at the expense of older people who starved to death in that camp to make sure that the children had enough to eat. So you might sometimes see this statistic that only 100 children survived to Asian stuff. It's not completely not true. Um, over a thousand children survived that camp. Many more children ended up coming into the camp at the in the kind of the as the Red Army was pushing down during the last days of the war. So when the camp was liberated, there were there were a thousand, a thousand four hundred, I think, children in the camp. So different uh, humanitarian aid organizations took charge of the children and tried to 
distribute them to various places. So some of them end up in displaced person camps uh, in Europe, and some of them end up going on to schemes to help child survivors. And this British agency, uh, the Central British Fund, ends up negotiating with the British government to take some of these children. So Jackie is put on a plane and brought to Britain at that point. It is actually a really fascinating story. It becomes more fascinating. That's why I'm writing a book on it, because he's he's then um, studied by Anna Freud, who is the daughter of Sigmund Freud, in a really influential study that she publishes in 1951 on these six toddlers who survived the concentration camp. Um, because of course, as psychologists and psychoanalysts are fascinated by the fact that these children, these infants, have probably never had a relationship with their mother. And yet they go on to, to develop normally. So Jackie and the other toddlers are kind of intensely studied. And this goes on for a very long time. And so he has his own responses to, to that as well. Um, so these are all things I'm, I'm looking at. But the, the kind of master question, the question of why did these infants survive is not a question that I think anybody in the world can answer. I mean, I hate to use the word luck because I've already told you all about this kind of trope of the lucky ones, but this is a case where there was some luck involved there. And I suspect there's something else as well. I can't prove it, but every one of the toddlers um, came from an unusual family in some sense. Many of them had, a, they, were, they came from single mothers and they had their mother's family name instead of their father's name. I suspect there may at some point have been an argument put out in the camp that possibly these children were only half Jewish and let's hold them back from onward deportation to the East because the children were deported from Theresienstadt to Auschwitz. It is a guess I'm making as to why so many of the children who survived came from single mothers. And I, I think it's not unreasonable, but it isn't something I can prove. Thank you so much for a fascinating answer and a fascinating presentation. And I'm sorry we, we have to we have to end a little early, but I hope you'll have an opportunity to study again. And and please send me the information about the new books so that I can let people know. So it's um, it's a work in progress. <laughs> I, I want to read it, and I think everybody here does as well, and everybody on the Zoom. So thank you. Thank you so much.